to the My Horse University and Extension Horse Quests live webcast on tractor and machinery safety. Uh, we're excited that you're joining us tonight. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Aaron Yoder from Penn State University. He earned his Bachelor of Science and Master's degrees in the Agricultural and Biological Engineering Department at Penn State University in 1997 and 1999, respectively, and his PhD in the Agricultural and Biological Engineering Department at Purdue University in 2002. After graduate school, he returned to Penn State as an instructor and extension safety associate. And as an instructor and extension safety associate for Penn State, he provides national leadership for the National Safe Tractor and Machinery Operation Program by coordinating online instructor training and educational programs for 4-Hers, volunteers, and county educators. In addition, he teaches within the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering and participates in other research and outreach programs for the Penn State Agricultural Safety and Health Program. Please note, if you haven't already, that you are able to ask questions during the presentation using the text chat on the left of your screen. So feel free to ask those throughout the presentation, and um, Dr. Yoder will answer them for us. And the presentation today is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website if you would like to review it at another time. And at this time, I will turn the presentation over to our presenter. All right. I guess I'm just going to check. Can uh, Amanda, can everybody hear me all right, or can you hear me okay? It sounds great to me. All right. Um, if you can't hear us, let us know in the chat pod over on the side, and I'll keep my eye on that as well to uh, to see if there are any questions as we go throughout this. Um, so again, my name's Aaron Yoder, and I'm from Penn State University. And uh, the title was Tractor Safety, but I've also, as you can see, I've uh, put a few other things in between there. Uh, so let's see if I'm up with technology here. There we go. Um, so that's me, and. Uh, I'm also going to be, as I mentioned, the question facilitator. I noticed that I didn't put my contact information anywhere in this slide set, so I'm going to type in uh, my email address here real quick for you to have if, if you uh, want to send me an email or have any questions afterwards. Um, we can uh, handle those as well. So an overview of today's presentation. Again, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat pod over there on the side as we right go through this. It's probably the best way to answer those. Um, but what we're going to cover today is looking at, uh, before we get to tractor safety, some other basic safety stuff that relates to tractor safety, looking at uh, mechanical hazards, safe clothing to wear around machinery and for other farm tasks um, or agriculturally related tasks, some hazard warning signs that we see on ag equipment, uh, the, some hand signals that we'll see we can use to help better communicate when we have the noise and commotion of equipment moving around. Um, our, and then getting into the tractor side of things, tractor stability, as we'll see, is one of the larger issues we have with tractors. Um, other ways to use the tractor safely and prevent injuries. And then also operating on public roadways, we see a lot of uh, incidents happening there, happening there as well. So starting off with these mechanical hazards, uh, what we have is uh, uh, a few common categories. They're not mutually exclusive, but what they have is uh, different ways that machines can injure us, basically, or where hazards are formed. Uh, the first one being a pinch point. This is where uh, we have two machine parts that are moving, and at least one of them is moving in a circle. We can see examples of these uh, in the pictures down below, chain drives, uh, feed rollers on certain machines. Um, and various things of that. So one of the best ways we can avoid these type of hazards, looking at the hazard and the avoidance of it, is to keep our machine guards in place. Um, and something we've done in some other projects, we've created some video sets that go along with these mechanical hazards as some other, ha as some other um, videos we'll see later on as well. But um, if we could pull up the uh, mechanical hazards video, give you an example of this technology. Pinch point. A pinch point is formed when two machine parts move together and at least one of the parts moves in a circle. Avoid these pinch points by keeping machine guards secured in place. 
So we're not going to show you this for each specific one of these, but there's a link on this page um, to the YouTube videos. We have a YouTube channel called Ag Safety for You, and you can see the, the link there as well for it. Uh, we'll see that link a little bit later on with some other another video demonstration we have. Uh, but we have a whole series of these. We also, um, as we'll see later on, we have a, a Farm Safety and Health e-extension group where we use these videos as part of an online training which we'll talk about later on. So there's some additional resources when we come to recognizing some of these hazards. So the next next hazard that we look at after pinch points um, will be wrap points. Um, a wrap point, uh, one of the most common ones, and you can see in the picture there, um, is a PTO shaft. And if you're not familiar with what PTO shafts are, these are the shafts that transmit power uh, from the tractor. You can see I'll see if I can get my pointer to work here. On the tractor side, we have a connection. Um, and then on the machinery side, we have a connection. And what this does is take the power from the tractor to a machine, uh, like a hay baler or a similar thing. Uh, manure spreaders oftentimes will use these. But it's a rotating shaft that's going to transmit power from one machine to another. Um, so we end up with a wrap point hazard. This is where uh, we'll talk about safe clothing later, but if you have long clothing, uh, loose clothing, they oftentimes, if you're in this area and they're operating, uh, which we don't recommend, you can actually get wrapped around these shafts and they can pull uh, your clothing and uh, individuals actually into the shaft. So that's where the, the term wrap point hazard comes from. So keeping all of our loose clothing tucked in, as we'll see in our uh, dress section, um, as well as any long hair or other dangling things uh, can help prevent these wrap point hazards or help prevent injuries due to the wrap point hazards. The next hazard is our shear point uh, hazards. This is when we have two sharp or two machine parts moving next to each other. Um, they can be sharp, uh, relatively sharp parts. One can be stationary, one can be moving. Uh, one example that I put on here is a hedge trimmer, if you've ever used one of those. Uh, there's a set of blades that stays stationary, there's another set that moves back and forth, and this creates a shearing effect or a shear point. Another example would be a pair of scissors or larger shears that you're using for uh, cutting other objects or even hair in some instances. So a lot of times what we can do or the best precaution to prevent these injuries would be to de-energize or shut off the machine uh, before we get close to those points. Or if there is a guard or a shield preventing us from getting close to them, keeping those um, in place. The next one would be a crush point. Uh, crush points, again, the definition when, are formed when two objects are moving towards each other and one object um, is stationary and the gap's closing. Uh, the example we have down in the corner for this one would be hooking up a drawbar, say on a tractor and an implement, uh, keeping our hands or anything else away from those areas as the machines are moving until they're secured, um, and then you can put the, uh, the pin in uh, to hold the two pieces together. So that's a, a, an often used example of a crush point. Um, this also comes up when we talk about hooking up implements and just ha ha standing between the tractor and the implement can create a crush point. So not allowing people around the equipment when it's actually moving um, on the ground. The next type of hazard would be the pull-in points. Pull-in points occur uh, typically where, where crops are fed into machinery. So when we're dealing a lot of times with animals, we talk about hay balers and creating the feed for those animals. So the hay baler where it takes in uh, the hay into the machine is going to be a spot where you could be pulled into it. Um, oftentimes we have rotating parts that come close to each other in corn pickers and that sort of thing where there are feed rollers. Uh, we can also have um, other types of, of pull-in points. We see the feed chamber on square railers. Um, the, the best way to avoid these hazards is to stay out of the way. And if we do have to do any sort of um, repairs or any adjustments in the area of these is to make sure the ma machine's completely shut down and that it's also um, stopped moving. Um, as we get to in a minute, sometimes machines don't shop, stop immediately when we shut them off. Another type of hazard that's formed are burn points. And uh, uh, the best example of this is the picture there, a muffler. When we're walking around machines, oftentimes engines will also get hot or fluids will get hot. Um, so we see a lot of 
um, burns in those and you may not realize that certain components are hot or you may incidentally come into contact with them when you're working on that uh, piece of machinery. Um, so we oftentimes will run into these, say, machine inspections. So when we're checking the oil or checking a fluid after the machine's been used, we can come into contact with some of these hot surfaces. Um, we want to make sure we, we are aware of where all these are at um, so that we can mitigate those burns. And that's something I should have mentioned early on with these different types of hazards is to uh, the best part to avoid the injuries is to realize where these hazards are at. And that's one reason why I'm covering them right now is so we can realize these hazards and identify these hazards before we need to come into uh, close proximity of them. Uh, as I mentioned before, not all machines come to a complete stop when you turn them off. Um, and this is where we run into freewheeling parts hazards um, because we, uh, with a lot of machinery, we are transmitting a whole lot of power and we need a lot of uh, force or effort to get some certain jobs done. And the example we have in the picture here is a the flywheel on a round baler. When we're compressing those bales of hay, we need um, surges of power. And what the flywheel does is help even that out and when we do need a little bit of extra um, force that flywheel can apply that for us but in mechanical things we can't turn off that power real quick or we'd end up breaking things or bending parts so when if you've ever been around a square baler baling hay you know when you turn that off that flywheel continues to rotate for it can be up to several minutes after uh, the machine is shut off and you'll see people do some things not that aren't so good to try to uh, slow those down before that. So oftentimes, um, again, something that we need to be aware of, as you can see on this baler, that flywheel isn't guarded at all. Uh, some of the newer ones have guards around those. So if there are guards, keep those in place. Uh, but being aware of it and staying away from any moving part while it's still uh, moving is the best way to avoid some of these freewheeling hazards. Another category, and this is probably the hardest category to see sometimes or to visualize, would be stored energy. And we have uh, uh, a stored energy hazard is when, when there's energy that's not being used or if we talked about, uh, go back to our physics days, this would be our potential energy. So we have energy there ready to be released. And most injuries um, are occur because of some unintentional release of energy. Um, so in this case, we have some examples of that. Um, we have springs. If we see on the back of the utility vehicle here, we have springs that are under compression. If we went to take those shocks off of there, those springs would try to release the energy that's stored in them. Um, another picture down here below is our hydraulic system uh, where we have a pump in the system that's pressurizing fluid. The fluid is doing some amount of work, in this case through a cylinder. We can see it lifting a load. Um, and then it's returned back to our cooler and reservoir and that sort of thing. But the thing to look at there, and this is what we typically see in lifts of uh, front end loaders and that sort of thing that we often use for hay bale handling, um, is that that pressure is stored under, or that fluid is stored under high pressure. So we can actually, if we uh, do something wrong and either cut a line or break a, a hydraulic line or take trying to take it off to do repairs on it, and we don't realize that stored energy is in there, uh, we can release the, the weight or the load that's on it, and that can lower down on top of us, which happens sometimes on front front end loader system. So we need to make sure everything's at rest, that all the high pressures are out of the system before we do any sort of uh, maintenance on hydraulic systems. And we can see those in various parts of tractors. Um, so we also have thrown object hazards. Uh, we see thrown objects, and you might be familiar with those from um, probably the best example is rotary mowers. Uh, we see those objects being thrown from that. Um, we also see um, other types of choppers or material handling, sometimes fans. Uh, we can have that uh, where thrown objects can get thrown into those. Uh, an example I like to use with my students with rotary mowers is uh, the tip speed of a rotary mower blade is around 100 miles an hour. So if that picks up a rock and throws it at you, that's similar to a, a major league baseball player throwing a baseball at you. And nobody's going to going to want to stand in front of something like that. So there's um, a, a visual example of what thrown objects can, the type of speeds they can have and the, and the types of, uh, you can imagine the types of damage they can do. 
Um, so some of the best ways to avoid these type of injuries is to make sure that um, nobody's around the discharge areas that where there's potential thrown objects or that there's no feed for those potential objects. So when you're mowing something, make sure that you clear the area of any rocks or other objects that could be thrown by the mower. Um, you can also keep anyone out of the area when you are doing mowing and other tasks that might uh, cause thrown objects. And then uh, as with most tasks, I think it's about any task you can do, wearing eye protection is a good way to uh, avoid the hazards. So after looking at the hazards, looking at some ways to avoid those. So when we start working around machinery or other aspects of agriculture, looking at the safe clothing. And if you're familiar with working with animals or horses, you know there's a, a whole set of clothing that you recommend to wear with those. Um, some of those are the same things when we come to machinery and some are a little different as we'll see. Um, but it does make you a, a smarter worker and avoid your chances of injury uh, when you're doing the tasks that you're trying to do. So. Um, it's it's also good to to understand what job you're going to be doing that day if you're going to be working indoors in the shade or outdoors in the sun and being prepared uh, for those as you go along and the same thing applies to when you're working with machinery snug fitting clothes are always good we mentioned dangling threads or slit or drawstrings things like that that can get stuck into some of those hazards we looked at especially the the pull-in points and the wrap points uh, so making sure we have snug clothing is good but you want to avoid clothing that's too tight where that can be restrictive in your movement as also as overheating you um, another thing that can get caught into machine parts is jewelry so we recommend not having any jewelry on um, this can even go down to rings and watches um, that can get caught or snagged on certain parts of the tractor especially when you climb on and off of tractors um, you oftentimes can get uh, caught in some equipment or caught on some of the the things that are sticking out, handle grabs or tire treads and that sort of thing. Uh, one thing that differs oftentimes with animal handling and machinery is the shoes that we wear. A lot of times when we ride horses, we need a certain type of shoe for our saddles and stirrups and that sort. Uh, when, we, when we talk about working around machinery, we want to have shoes that have good tread on them, um, things that uh, are going to withstand um, as we mentioned there, livestock trampling, but other welding sparks or other machinery hazards that we may not think about when we're doing anime, animal handling. And then oftentimes, depending on the task we're doing, if there's a chance of dropping heavy objects on our feet, um, which oftentimes when we're attaching or unattaching or doing machinery maintenance, uh, we oftentimes can run into. Uh, we want to make sure we keep our shoes tied snugly. So again, we're talking about shoes with laces uh, so that they don't get caught in rotating parts. And then if we have any long hair, making sure we have that out of the way. Um, and that applies to other types of machinery that we see in the shop using drills and other hand tools and power tools as well. Um, Oftentimes, uh, people in hot weather will try to avoid wearing long pants, but uh, we know that long pants are good for protecting us from many things, including sunburns and other objects, but as well as um, mechanical hazards or cuts and scrapes that may come from machinery or even burns that may come from machinery. And we know that sloppy clothing can also uh, become, become entangled in machinery. Um, and so to summarize that, these are some finely dressed people that we can see um, that are wearing some of the protective clothing that we may see working with machinery. Uh, we may not think of other types of machinery, even string trimmers and other types of grounds maintenance equipment wearing the white right or the correct type of clothing for that. Other ways to avoid hazards, so moving on from the clothing or some and some of those other hazards that we see is to, to look at the, the labels and manuals and um, decals that are on some of the machinery, including our tractors and our implements that we use with that. Um, one of the symbols that is a standard practice in owner's manuals, as well as on most safety labels or decals, as we'll see in a minute, um, is the safety alert symbol triangle with an exclamation point in the middle of it has a couple different meanings it means that you need to show your attention be alert of something and typically this is used when your safety is involved so we see this again it's an industrial standard uh, we see it used across agricultural construction and industrial equipment and we see it again on owner's manuals 
and uh, hazard warning signs. So when we see hazard warning signs, there should be a few good parts to them or what makes up a good hazard warning sign we should see. And you'll see better examples of this on newer equipment. Some of the older equipment may be missing this. Um, but uh, if some of your hazard warning labels are missing, you oftentimes can get replacements for them. Um, but a good hazard warning sign warns you of what type of hazards there by having um, different types of hazard warning uh, words on it. Uh, it also provides ways of, uh, of safety precautions or things to do to avoid the hazard that's being alerted to and then provide uh, other directions to eliminate or reduce that hazard as well by oftentimes they'll say keep guards in place. Here are some of the examples of the, the warning words that we see or the, or the uh, action words that we see uh, from danger being the most severe, uh, warning being a little less severe, and then caution being uh, a little less. Uh, but you will need to pay attention to all these hazards. The red hazards are the ones that are uh, immediately dangerous to life, I guess they would call it. Um, and these are very similar to the hazard warning signs if you're familiar with pesticide safety. They'll use the same type of uh, degree words when we look at different types of hazards and how those apply. But if we look at those labels, we'll see they're a little blurry, but we'll see that uh, triangle with the exclamation point to get our attention. And then the different types of hazards that are present. And we'll look at some of the other parts of these. Typically, a, a, a good label or a good hazard warning sign will have pictorials on it. Um, these are graphical representations, so we don't need to be, worry about reading a lot of words before we can realize what the hazard is. Um, so oftentimes, they will represent either the hazard, the situations, precautions for the hazard, what happens if you don't avoid the hazard, or a combination of these. So we have some examples of those. Uh, we can see the first one with a tractor with a front lift. It's telling you if you lift something that's heavy or round up too high, it may roll back on you. Uh, we can see the middle one in the top of the electrocution hazard or the shock hazard. Uh, the third one across the top on the top right corner looking at um, a, a crushing injury or something that could fall on us. Uh, we see the typical picture that uh, in the bottom left that looks like Gumby wrapped around a, sh uh, a stick there, but what that is, that's a standardized symbol that they use around PTO shafts. And what that does is uh, tell us that there's a, a wrap point hazard, as we looked at earlier. And then we also have a, a climbing hazard or a fall hazard. Um, they would refer to that as a fall from an elevation. So looking at falling off different pieces of equipment. A few more of those pictorials that we can look at. The top left, looking at a stored energy hazard. We, I didn't mention this. I mentioned hydraulics, but if we have pinhole leaks in hydraulics, those can cause injection injuries, and we can end up with fluids inside our body that our body's not used to. So that gives us an example. Oftentimes, you'll see these around high hydraulic hoses and connections. Um, the overhead power lines one we can see in the middle top. Uh, the runover hazard on the top right. There's a hazard when we get to uh, tractors uh, where people try to start them from the ground and then they can end up, if the tractor's in gear and doesn't have all the safety features that it should have, we can see people being run over by tractors. Uh, slip and fall on the bottom, we have augers uh, where you can end up with uh, fingers cut off and then flying objects. Uh, the bottom right tells us that we should be wearing our uh, eye protection as well as hearing protection. And you may see this, for example, in a service manual of a string trimmer uh, would be an example of where you'd find that. So that takes care of our hazard warning signs. Now we're moving into the hand signal segment, so we'll have another video here shortly. Uh, but the first one, we have a series of hand signals that are generally accepted by the industry um, looking at... Um, how we communicate with people operating machinery. Um, and it's good to, to train all our employees on this because oftentimes when machinery is running, we can't really hear what's going on. Um, so these give us an opportunity to communicate with our employees or with the other people that are operating the machinery when we don't have uh, the opportunity to communicate verbally. Um, so the first one here is uh, this far to go. Um, oftentimes an example of when they're using this would be when you're backing a piece of equipment in. Uh, you can keep moving your hands together as we'll see in the video here. And that what that'll do is uh, tell the person when they're close to where they're at. This is great for hooking up trailers and other things as well. So we'll watch that real quick.
This far to go. Place palms at ear level facing head and move laterally inward to indicate remaining distance to go. So we're going to review these hand signals that we have, and I just have a, a pictorial of them. If you go to that YouTube site again, you're going to see um, there's a whole series of these. These are actually up there in both English and Spanish, and that's one thing nice about these hand signals is it doesn't matter what language you're using, um, they're going to mean the same thing. So um, the Spanish version is up there, um, which illustrates that as well. Um, so this one, as it mentioned in the video, we have placing our ears or hands at ear level, uh, facing our head and moving them together, and the video demonstrated that uh, very well. The next one that we look at means come to me. Um, what that is is you raise your arm vertically over your head and circle with the palm to the front and rotate your hand in a circle uh, if you want people to come into your direction. Uh, there's move towards me if you want someone to move in a specific direction. Uh, you can stand there and pull that back um, rather than just bringing people in from all directions. This one gives them a specific direction. So uh, you can point towards that person or vehicle that you want to come towards you and signal by holding your arm horizontally in front of your face, motioning towards your body. So we have move out and take off as another one. If you want someone to go out and do something, you face the direction you want them to move, hold your arm, extend it to the rear and swing it forward overhead, sort of like throwing a baseball, um, until um, the arm's horizontal with the ground, with palm down. Missing a letter there. Uh, stop, which most of us probably have seen or used before. This is where you raise your hand upward extending your arm fully with the palm to the front and hold your hand up there until they do what you tell them to do. You shouldn't be waving it around or swinging it or anything. Some people start yelling if it's not listened to right away though. Um, speed up or increase it. This is sort of the opposite of the, the signal you may have used to try to get a trucker to, to blow their horn. Um, you're actually pushing up with your fist, so raise your hand up to your shoulder, close your fist, and thrust it up into the air. Um, and you can do this rapidly uh, to tell somebody to speed up. Slow down, and you've probably seen this one if you've uh, driven too fast through a construction zone. You'll see people giving you this symbol. So you hold your arm horizontally to the side, wave your arm downward to 45 degrees, and do that a few times, almost like you're pushing down on something. Uh, you want to try to keep your arm below horizontal when you do this, and you'll see people doing this. Like I mentioned again in uh, construction sites, you'll see this hand signal being used a lot. We have start the engine, which comes back from. Um, the days of cranking an engine to get it started in the front. So we move our arm in a circular motion at waist level uh, to simulate that cranking of the engine to get people to start their engines. And uh, I'm not a NASCAR fan, but I think you might even see them use this symbol when they're telling the people to start their engines. Stop the engine, uh, drawing your right hand palm down across your neck, sort of a throat cutting motion left to right to tell people to shut off their engines or shut the machine down. Um, when we're dealing with equipment that can be raised and lowered, we'll see uh, lower your equipment by swinging or uh, using a circular motion with either hand pointing down towards the ground. And the corresponding one to that would be raise the equipment, so making a circular motion uh, with either hand at, at uh, above head level. Uh, not to be with, confused with the one that you use your whole arm to do come to me. Other hand signals that we can use um, are ones we were trained to use probably in our driver training classes um, or definitely in our bicycle safety track classes. And this would be stop and left turn and right turn. When you're operating machinery on roadways, oftentimes machinery won't have turn signals on it. Uh, this illustration actually does, but you won't always see that. Uh, so using those standardized hand signals can be good to avoid uh, confusion with motorists that may be on the roadway or other people that you're working with. We also have the left turn, which is sticking your arm straight out. Um, and then going along with that, we have the right turn as well, uh, where you put your, you're using your left arm for all these symbols, but you put your left arm straight up in the air uh, to get our right turn. 
moving more into more specific to tractors, but um, this stuff can even apply to other machinery, whether it's a utility vehicle you may be using um, or uh, four wheelers, anything that uh, has some wheels on it and has the opportunity to, to tip over. Uh, when we look at tractor stability, this is an important issue when we talk about tractor safety. Um, because the second bullet point here when we look at nearly half of all tractor fatalities uh, come from tractor overturns and a lot of the figures and statistics we base this off of our fatalities um, because it's easier to collect that information than it is to collect injury information uh, but we know there's a fair amount of injuries that go along with each tractor rollovers and overturns as well um, and when we look at machine hazards in agriculture back to the first point there um, the, the tractor uh, typically ends up causing about half of all ag, ag uh, occupational related injuries in agriculture um, and then half of those are the rollovers um, so we're looking at a quarter of all injury occupational injuries that happen in agriculture in states like ours in Pennsylvania and other northeastern states uh, typically even have a higher rate of tractor overturns in some other states as well for various reasons as we'll see as we go through this. But we know tractors are used for different tasks. Um, it's a very versatile machine and now we're seeing other machines being used in that same way um, in other other areas. Um, so we see a lot of use um, of utility vehicles and other things like that. We know that if we use a rollover protective structure or the roll bar and the seat belt, um, we can save lives and we have data to support that we, that we can look at if we do have an overturn while we're operating. Uh, they're designed to protect that operator. Um, when we talk about tractor stability and overturn, some, there's a few concepts we need to understand. Uh, the first one is center of gravity. Um, if you've ever done any experiments with holding up a stick or something like that, you can find a point in the middle that you can balance that the mass of something. And that's what the center of gravity is. So we can, we can balance, uh, if we think about where the center of all the mass is on a machine, we have that center of gravity. And the, the picture here illustrates um, where the center of gravity is typically at on a tractor. Um, it's somewhere between the operator's ankles and knees typically. Um, about 10 inches above and 12 inches in front of the rear axle when we're looking at a two-wheel drive tractor. Uh, oftentimes when we look at a four-wheel drive tractor or a front-wheel assist tractor, that center of gravity moves a little bit further forward. Um, so we see that in this picture. If we look down from above, we have two different uh, samples of where the, the center of gravity in, is. Again, if we look at a two-wheel drive tractor, we can see those center of gravities. Um, both in the center if we're looking at an older tricycle type tractor and then we also have uh, the center of gravity on a on a wide front end tractor. Uh, unfortunately we still see quite a few of these narrow front end tractors uh, around. Uh, the ATV industry realized quite a while ago that that's not a good thing that's why they don't make three-wheelers anymore because the lack of stability on those but uh, that they don't make tractors like that anymore but there's still a lot of those around again. So that's the center of gravity. Something else we talk about is the stability baseline, and that's these lines that are connecting uh, the tires and where they make contact to the ground. So we can see that both on the, the two-wheel drive and the four-wheel drive tractor. So that gives us our stability baseline. So understanding how a tractor overturns, um, these two come into play. So we have these lines connecting the ground, and if we get this center of gravity ever comes outside the stability baseline, uh, physics tells us that the tractor is going to overturn. So there are a couple things to remember about that. It won't overturn if that center of gravity stays inside the stability baseline. Um, the center of gravity, if we're going on slopes, up and down bumps, uh, we're going to see that center of gravity moving around inside the baseline area. Um, that, as we mentioned, the wide front end tractor provides more space for that center of gravity to move around. Um, so for wide front end tractors are going to be more stable than those, than the uh, narrow front end tractors. So we look at why does the center of gravity go outside the stability baseline? So why do tractors roll over? Um, the most obvious one or the one that most people think of is operating the tractor on a steep slope. If we get it steep enough, uh, as we'll see in a later illustration here, um, 
that center of gravity goes outside the stability baseline and the tractor tips over. Um, we can raise that center of gravity higher, putting a front end loader on it, lifting a heavy load up in the air actually moves that center of gravity um, up and forward, um, which can help move it outside the stability baseline. If the tractor is going too fast for a turn, we'll see centrifugal force acts on um, the tractor. Or if power is applied to the tractor's rear wheels too quickly, um, we can lift the front end off the ground, which could pull that center of gravity behind the tractor or behind the rear stability baseline. And oftentimes we'll see people um, trying to pull loads and not hitch them to the appropriate place or the drawbar of the tractor. So here's looking at the, uh, the side view. Here we can see our normal center of gravity is the black dot. Um, so the black dot in the center here, we can have our normal center of gravity. If for some reason we've raised the center of gravity by putting weight higher, um, it can be spray tanks or it can be a front end loader, we may raise that center of gravity. So if we have a raised center of gravity and we're operating on a slope, we can see down at the bottom that at that same slope, the lower center of gravity would be safer. The higher center of gravity is going to be outside that stability baseline. Um, so it's important. Um, if we do have front end loaders or any sort of heavy weight on the machine, that we keep that as low as possible. Um, because as we can see in the last bullet point there, um, we can hit a bump on the high side, we can hit a groundhog hole or depression on the low side, and this can be enough to move that center of gravity outside our stability baseline, or the if we want to think of it, where the, where the tire contacts the ground. <laughs> So a few more things on that. Um, front end loader uh, can be mounted on the tractor to raise that, as I mentioned. The bucket in the low position could prevent that from moving up. And then um, we can see how that is, is moving out to the side. Another way we can move that center of gravity around is with centrifugal force. Um, and my best description to my students of centrifugal force is if you ever put water in a bucket and swung it around over your head and the water's actually stayed in there, that centrifugal force that's holding that water in that bucket as you're spinning it. So anything you move in, a, in an arced pattern like that is going to have centrifugal force acting on it. So if we have a tractor um, and we make a sharp turn with it, or we're on a hillside and we make a sharp turn especially, um, we can see that force acting on the center of gravity uh, and that, what that's going to do is try to take that center of gravity outside of our stability baseline. Um, we know that centrifugal force increases uh, as the turning angle of the tractor becomes sharper, and as the speed of the tractor increases, we see an increase in centrifugal force. Um, so when we start um, running faster and turning sharper, we see these, and this is also very apparent when we talk about other machinery, especially ATVs um, and dirt bikes and motorcycles and that sort of thing. Um, when we look at the relationships between these, uh, the biggest relationship or the most significant one is with speed. So we have our examples of uh, when we speed up, um, we hear people say in, car, in uh, automobile accidents and stuff that speed kills and speed has a, a huge impact on the amount of forces that go into a collision or a rollover or whatever you um, are talking about the re where the release of energy happens. So an example of that is if we double our tractor speed say from three to six miles per hour the strength of that centrifugal force um, we have a square on that, so that would be two times two or up to four. Uh, tripling the speed from three to nine miles per hour has a, a nine times um, increase on the amount of centrifugal force we have pulling on that. So it's really almost a, a, an exponential increase in the centrifugal force uh, for a doubling of um, ground speed. Centrifugal force is oftentimes what ends up pushing tractors over when it's driven too fast. Um, oftentimes we'll see these on roadway uh, incidents where someone's towing a trailer, tries to avoid something on the roadway, or tries to move off the roadway um, in some cases. So um, a lot of tractors don't have the best handling when we're going at higher speeds. Um, so they end up um, 
intensifying the centrifugal force by making abrupt movements on the roadway. Uh, so we see that happening quite often. Or if the tractor starts bouncing and the tire turns and when it comes down from bouncing, it can lead to these type of injuries as well. Overcorrecting in many situations, as I mentioned. Um, so centrifugal, this centrifugal force is often the factor we see in our side overturns. Um, so, and this can be intensified or added to if we look at it when we're already on a, the side stability baseline or the center of gravity is already closer to the side stability baseline because we're on a hillside uh, or something that's bringing that over to the side. We see other types of um, situations where this can happen as well. We have uh, a twisting force on the rear axle that they talk about rear axle torque. This is more when we're looking at um, rear overturns. Um, typically what we have is the tractor tires can rotate um, and that provides our forward motion. But if for some reason that rear tire gets stuck in the mud or sometimes people chain them to, to specific things, say fence posts to try to pull them out, um, what can happen is the front end of the tractor can rear up and go over um, to the back as we'll see here in a minute. Um, once we get up to a point, they talk about the point of no return. Um, that happens faster uh, than a second typically three quarters of a second. So here we have the center of gravity of the tractor. And the point of no return is where the center of gravity is directly above our axle. Um, if it goes any further than this, it's gonna turn over rearward. There's nothing we can do to stop that. If we can disengage the rear axle before this happens, the front end will come back down. Um, so we see this happening in, in rear overturns. Uh, we mentioned earlier the importance of ROPS. This tractor in the illustration has a roll bar on it, which is going to limit our degree of roll to 90 degrees. So we're, we're not going to have that uh, tractor coming completely over on the operator. Unfortunately, a lot of older tractors that people use to try to pull things or tow things um, do not have these roll bars on them, and then the tractor completely comes over. Um, and one thing about the rear overturns is oftentimes they're uh, more fatal than the side overturns. In the side overturns, sometimes people can get thrown out of the way. Um, in these rear overturns, you're, you're basically trapped, and your natural reaction is to grab onto that steering wheel tighter, which just holds you into place. Um, so the rear overturns um, are definitely are, are ones that can be more fatal for us. When we look at the rear overturns, other, other things that can lead to that is if we're, again, the illustration being on a hillside, we can see that our center of gravity is coming back closer to that stability baseline. Again, the stability baseline being the point uh, where the tires contact the ground. <clears throat> other examples of, of where this happens, we can get the tires frozen in the ground. We can get stuck in a mud hole. Um, often, sometimes I'll see people that uh, put blocking and other things like that under the tires to get out of the mud. Um, and this can prevent that rear tire from spinning, which can bring the, the tractor's front end up off the ground. Uh, we mentioned in the illustration here the slope. Um, so there's less, less movement of that center of gravity needed to roll the tractor over rearward. Um, when we, when we think about how this happens, we know two-wheel drive tractors, when we're pulling a load, the rear tires are sort of pushing against the tr ground. Um, the, the load on the tractor is pushing down against the movement of the tractor, and we'll see that in an illustration here shortly. Um, we look at this, this load that's pulling backwards, and we talk about an angle of pull. So we'll take a look at that in this illustration. It's actually the bottom illustration here. We talk about an angle of pull. And I was just talking about this with a coworker the other day about how we can possibly uh, explain this a little bit better because um, the some of the f people that are more into physics may have a different way of explaining this. But the angle of pull is that angle we're looking at from whatever we're pulling where it contacts the ground up to our attachment point or right on the drawbar. There are a few things we can do. What we want to do to prevent these rear overturns is to decrease that angle of pull. So the angle underneath the dotted the dotted line or the angle down in this pocket here, we want to make that smaller. And there are a few ways we can do that. We can use a longer tow rope. So our point of attachment would come out further in this direction, further towards the tractor. 
Uh, so that would minimize the angle. If we can lower our draw bar or our attachment point a little bit lower, that would lower our angle. Um, but another thing we could do to improve this situation would be to um, raise our attachment point on the object that we're pulling. Um, basically, our tow rope's trying to get parallel to the ground. And to do that, oftentimes what it'll do is lower our attachment point, which brings our front end up off of the ground. So looking at that angle of pull, trying to, to minimize that angle of pull um, by better attachment points um, and also by um, lengthening our, our tow rope. But sometimes that's a disadvantage to what we're trying to pull out of the ground. Unfortunately, sometimes people will end up attaching to higher points on the tractor, which makes that angle of pull greater. So we can see if we attached up there, this line would come up to a higher point, which gives us a bigger angle, angle of pull and more likelihood of a rear overturn. Um, so there are different ways. Some older tractors actually have draw bars, um, <clears throat> draw, draw bars that are hooked to the three-point hitch. Uh, so the draw bar that we're talking about here, I should mention that first. On the rear of your tractor, you'll have a bar coming out with a hole in it uh, that you can hook implements to. Some of the older tractors, I know the 8N tractors, oftentimes will use a, a uh, three-point mounted draw bar. And a hazard that happens here when people don't use these stay braces is they can raise this up, raise the draw bar up, and that ends up giving them a higher angle of pull, which can be a, a hazardous situation for us. So that's sort of the hazards that are present with a rollover. So how do we protect ourselves from those? And we had mentioned the, the rollover protective structures. And even if you have a tractor that um, doesn't have these on them, there are some programs out there in certain states to retrofit older tractors. Um, but roll bars are available for most older tractors, not all older tractors. Um, but this rollover protective structure we say it's 99.9% .9 effective. We don't know of a, a, a specific case in a rollover where someone was killed by, by when they've had the roll bar and have worn their seatbelt. Um, and we had mentioned earlier that the uh, rollover protective structure is the roll bar and the seatbelt together, um, as we can see in the illustration in the top right corner. If you don't have your seatbelt on, you can be thrown off in different situations. Um, but we know having this roll bar on is going to keep our um, keep us in a protected zone if we do have a tractor rollover. They're not going to prevent tractors from rolling over, but it's going to help us in situations uh, where we may uh, experience a tractor rollover. Um, and the, the final bullet point there, wearing your seatbelt, um, definitely helps protect you more in the case of a rollover. Having the roll bar on the tractor provides some degree of protection, and it's better than not having a roll bar, uh, but having the seatbelt um, even adds an extra layer of, of protection there for you. What the ROPS does, or the roll bar system, um, or rollover protection system, is um, limits the degree of roll of the tractor. It's supposed to limit the degree to 90 degrees to the side and 90 degrees to the rear, so it maintains that protective zone. Um, even better are um, enclosed cabs that would have roll bars built or rollover ROPS built into them, rollover protective systems built into them, um, because oftentimes they can keep us protected even more from some of the environmental hazards that may happen in the rollover or some of the um, unforeseen hazards that come up. And this, uh, when we say that, we're assuming the cab doors and windows are not removed in some of those situations. Um, tractors really are designed uh, to, can be operated safely if they're used how they're designed to be used and you follow the recommendations and recommended practices. Um, when we look at um, farm tractor fatalities, we see about 300 per year across the United States. Um, typically, um, we're looking at some states having as high as 10 or 15 tractor-related ones, other states a little bit lower. These are just some examples uh, that we pulled out of some of our um, injury statistics that we collect uh, from people using tractors for other purposes, spotting deers in the woods. Um, Oftentimes, people that will have extra riders, um, which um, I didn't mention yet, but you know, preventing extra people from riding on the tractors um, uh, because they're not designed to have extra people. Some of the new, newer tractors have training seats, which are really meant for somebody that's training somebody. That training seat isn't in the protected zone by the rollover protective structure. 
Um, we see people using um, tractors in the woods a lot um, to, to collect firewood. Here's an example, um, the third bullet point there of, of track, a tractor pulling out a truck that was in the woods. Um, oftentimes we see people uh, trying to pull stuck motorists along the side of the road and turning their tractors over then. So a lot of the uses that people do with tractors that result in overturns aren't always uh, production agriculturally related. Um, and then another one when we start looking at front end loaders, which a lot of tractors have these days uh, to handle various equipment, but um, leaving those up in the air, which we mentioned earlier, raises that center of gravity. Um, some other things uh, when we look at what tractors are really supposed to be used for or the main purpose of tractors or they're the remote power source to carry and pull machines to move loads and to transport materials. Um, and if we, we try to stick to these uses and do those correctly, um, we can mitigate a lot of the hazards that, that happen or a lot of the injuries that happen because of some of the hazards that exist. Um, and again, as we mentioned earlier with the hazard warning signs, that the operator's manual is a great place or the owner's manual is a great place to go to find out what the limitations of your machine are and how to use it properly. Um, and most machines you can dig up an owner's manual for, even if it's an older one, most manufacturers still have a supply of those. Uh, and it's always good to familiarize yourself with your equipment before you start using it. Some other examples of unsafe um, practices, as I show here, uh, we see the extra riders, which happen a lot on tractors. Um, again, the if the machine only has one seat, it's really only designed for one person to be on it. Um, we see the rotating parts, and this picture is a little hard to see, but you can see an unprotected PTO shaft. As we talked about some of those hazards that existed, we were actually showing shafts that had guards on them. This is an unprotected shaft, and we can see um, that there are lots of parts from the, the square shaft on it to the knuckles on the end of it or the universal joints that are going to be places that if that part is rotating, uh, we can get wrapped up into or caught into. Um, also, we had mentioned um, attaching properly to the tractor. Here's another example of hitching too high. We mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, that we should be hitching to the drawbar, which would be down in this area. But oftentimes people will um, hitch higher, thinking that they can pick the front end of the log up off the ground. And recently we've been seeing a lot more um, log towing related injuries uh, using tractors because people are out cutting their own firewood with energy costs going up um, and doing more wood burning and that sort of thing. Um, so again, making sure the owner's manual tell you how to do this. Um, but again, if we look at or want to think about that, um, angle of pull which we talked about before from the rope down to the ground where if that would have been hooked to the drawbar that angle would be a lot less so hitching correctly uh, towing things correctly people will do this again when they're trying to pull a stuck car out of the ditch uh, they'll end up hitching to the tractor inappropriately um, other things when we're towing equipment making sure we have enough change again having uh, competent people do uh, both driving of the towed equipment as well as the towing equipment um, using the appropriate rated tow cable or chain or strap uh, to be pulling the equipment that we're towing as well. Here's just a few more examples um, that come from, uh, we'll mention some other resources later, but these come out of John Deere has some safety books for uh, this one's from safety management for landscapers, ground care businesses, and golf courses, but they also have some ag equipment books um, as well as they have a newer version of their ag safety manual. But uh, the first example up here in the corner looking at uh, ditches and banks, we should never get closer to the bank than the height that it is. So we see this bank is six feet high. We shouldn't get closer than six feet to it or we end up with a shear line uh, that that bank could give way and uh, cause us to um, slide down over it and possibly result in an overturn. Same thing we mentioned before of our centrifugal force acting on our center of gravity of the tractor when we make turns. Uh, avoiding obstacles, we can see that's changing our center of gravity position, moving it closer to that stability baseline. 
and then our rear tipping as we mentioned this angle of pull that occurs under here this chain is trying to get parallel with the ground so it's going to take the front end of the tractor up um, as high as it needs to until that attachment point gets down to the point where it's parallel with the ground and the hitching point that we're hooked to our object <laughs> We mentioned the obstructions uh, or depressions that occur in our fields that oftentimes we can't see. So if we're already operating on a hillside and we either hit the obstruction or the depression, that can move our center of gravity outside of that stability baseline. Um, again, the front end loaders, if our center of gravity is typically down here, if we have that front end loader full of stuff, we can move that center of gravity up higher and more forward uh, in some situations. Um, <laughs> This is a severe case of being stuck in the mud, uh, but being stuck in the mud can lead to various hazards. And then our uh, overhead power lines, as we mentioned before, or saw in some of our other pictograms, um, that that can be a hazard to, to be aware of. Um, and fi the final topic we're looking at here is operating on public roadways. And uh, actually found, and if anyone's interested, there was a great video I, I came across today that uh, Ohio State Extension put on YouTube um, about, uh, it's actually Amish buggy safety, but it talks a great deal about the closure that we're looking at in this diagram of if something's moving at a slow speed and something else is moving at a high speed, um, how quickly that can occur and how little time we have to react. There we can see 400 feet or more than a football field, we can tra we can close on something in uh, less than seven seconds. So we see a lot more people traveling on the roadways. Uh, in our first point here, um, different fields that are connected by roads that we need to transport, maybe rented fields and that sort of thing. Um, or if your barn's not in the same location as some of the rest of your farm, oftentimes we get more movement on the roads. So we have these slower moving vehicles uh, we know the general public's driving faster. Our cars allow us to handle better and do that. Um, so we see a lot of motor vehicle crashes with our farming equipment. And uh, I've seen quite a few stories recently with planting season coming up in different areas of uh, motor vehicles uh, running into to different machinery. Um, so keeping aware of that when you're out there, um, some ways we, we'll look into protecting ourselves um, <clears throat> excuse me, some of these situations where we see this arise, um, we have sl our slow moving vehicles with heavy loads um, traveling at slower speeds, uh, maybe making different turns across traffic and not signaling or not having the right lighting and marking. So we see those type of things happening. Um, and then oftentimes we'll see wide machinery going down the road. Um, and then we also have the potential for spilled stuff on the roadways uh, that people may run into. So we have uh, the same rules apply to tractors as other vehicles, um, but <clears throat> oftentimes other people don't uh, provide those same uh, courtesies to us when we're operating tractors on the roads. Um, we look at regulations on this. Some states are really tight with this. Other states are pretty lax when it comes to who can drive things on roads. And a lot of times the people driving machinery on roads may not have the same driving training as some of the motor vehicle operators. Um, so if you have questions on that, it's best to contact your uh, local police. And uh, we need sometimes to be reminded that when we're operating machinery, just because it's hard to start and stop our machine uh, still means we need to obey those traffic laws. It doesn't mean we're uh, exempt from obeying some of those. Um, again, some basic standards of, of looking at how we can light or mark, as they refer to it, our equipment, um, looking at having the appropriate lighting and marking, and there's some examples of that from how many headlights, tail lights, flashing lights, and again, this is going to vary state by state, um, so it's best to contact your, your local state police or motor vehicle code uh, to come up with what you need to do in your individual state. Um, here's just some examples of lighting and marking. We can see reflectors, our slow-moving vehicle emblem on both of our tractors, um, other lights as well. Um, and uh, the same thing with on motor vehicles. When we're on the highway, there are certain lights, like this example shows our work light. Uh, we need to make sure certain lights are turned off um, because uh, they can just confuse other motorists 
if they see those. Um, some other things to be aware of, and we're getting close to our wrap-up time here, and I think there's only a few more slides to go, um, so bear with me. Um, but looking at some of our time of day, um, looking at our courtesy, and I'm not going to read through all those, but just basic courtesy that we'd have if we have the opportunity to get out of the way and let some traffic pass, that uh, can be a good thing. Um, looking for blind spots that you may not be able to see other parts of the traffic. We have our shifting load problems and making sure we have safe equipment before we go out on the roadways with it. The same thing we should be doing with our motor vehicles. Um, again, when we, when we tow equipment out on public roads, we should have um, good safety hitch pins um, that are rated with our locking clip on them. Um, as well as, to, as chains, so that if, like we do on other trailers, if we have um, a hitch pin come out, the chain will help protect us, and then making sure we have the appropriate SMV symbols as well. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, using our hand signals when we're turning on roadways, um, and here's just some more examples of lighting and marking. We can see extremity markers, um, as well as our SMV symbols. If the one on the tractor's blocked, we should also have one on our equipment uh, that can be seen. And there are different standards for these now where they're reflective from, then can be seen from greater distances than some of the older faded ones. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have some resources um, sort of in the wind up mode here. And again, um, I haven't seen any questions, but we'll open it up here again. If you have any, feel free to ask them. Uh, but we do have our e-extension site um, or landing page for farm safety and health, and we can see the address for that. Uh, the Penn State Ag Safety site is agsafety.psu.edu, and there's more contact information and inf information about some of the resources we have. We have a National Safe Tractor and Machinery Operation Program uh, that was originally intended to train 14 and 15 year olds to comply with a Department of Labor regulation, um, but we have resources that can be used with any age audience when it comes to tractor and machinery safety, and some of the materials I use today um, go along with that. We have our Twitter site, Ag Safety for You, as well as a YouTube channel, Ag Safety for You, that uh, has those hand signal videos and some other videos of agricultural hazards there as well. Um, they would like your uh, feedback on this presentation, and I know My Horse University um, collects this information and, and uses it to improve their webcasts um, and want to know what they can better serve you with. Um, they do have some upcoming webcasts, and I don't know if Amanda wants to take over on that from here or uh, wants me to cover these last couple sure. slides. Yeah, I can. Yep, sure. I can give a little wrap up and. Um, you can still feel free to answer some or to ask some questions in the chat box while I'm doing so. But um, yeah, we have a couple of upcoming webcasts. Well, actually, um, next month, well, which is next week, will be our last one for this season. And that one is going to be on pasture rotation next Tuesday, May 1st at 7 p.m. And then we'll have our free monthly webcast return in September. Um, we do those September through May. Um, and most importantly, I just want to thank Aaron for this presentation this evening and to thank all of you for your participation. Um, and we did record tonight's webcast, so if you would like to watch it again or recommend it to someone else, you can check myhorseuniversity.com by the end of the week and it will be there. And you can always send us your comments and suggestions to info at myhorseuniversity.com by email. So um, thanks again and have a great night. And uh, if we don't see any questions, then um, we'll go ahead and close out, but we'll give you just a minute to type those in if you've got them. Thank you.